on my way home from the gym, I popped into Bad Billy's, looking for a man I was hoping was in the bathroom. <laughs> As for how I got into another man's shorts, that is no one's business. Ah, uh, Dr. Fraser Crane, a man who wears short shorts to a gay bar, who has gay friends and co-workers, who enjoys stereotypically gay hobbies, but how's his gay dar? Well, it turns out that's a bit of a blind spot for him, which is how, in 2003, he wound up dating Captain Picard. All aboard, and welcome to Matt Baum's Culture Cruise. In last month's video, we took a look at the evolution of queer characters across the gay 90s, with the show Frasier offering up more LGBTQ episodes than any other sitcom until Ellen and Will and Grace. This month, I want to take a look at Frasier's final gay episode, 2003's The Doctor Is Out, in which, after years of flirting with gay cliches, Frasier finally flirts with a gay person. By the way, thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible with a pledge of support on Patreon, folks like Robert Hare, Kevin Schlemmer, and Jack Smith. If you're enjoying these videos, head over to patreon.com slash mattbaum to check out those rewards for backers. The Doctor Is Out came at the climax of a particularly turbulent time for LGBTQ folks on TV. As I talked about in the last video, throughout the 90s, gay characters evolved from being a source of fear, to a fact of life, to being aspirational, to finally being so mainstream, there was no one way they were depicted. It was a huge change from one end of the decade to the other, and The Doctor's Out features all of those different depictions packed into a half-hour farce with a bit of a twist. So let's set the scene. It's 2003, season 11, and Frasier has already had episodes featuring a gay boss, a gay dream, a gay dad, and gay friends. This episode begins with something new, a gay celebrity. It's Alistair Burke, director of the Seattle Opera, played by Patrick Stewart. In real life, Sir Patrick was a big deal at this time, and we'll talk about that in a minute. For now, Fraser and Niles are simply beside themselves to have run into him. <laughs> and how well you're looking, oh, too. Thank you. I like your suit. Okay, I can't fault them for fanning out here. I'd probably melt if I saw Patrick Stewart in the wild. But he quickly scampers off, having set up the A-plot. With that out of the way, the Cranes can move on to the B-plot, meeting Roz's new boyfriend, Barry. Frasier immediately suspects that Barry is gay. The giveaway, he has muscles, he works in fashion, and he helps Roz pick out clothes. He spent a whole day last week going through my closet and throwing out all the stuff I shouldn't wear anymore. One wonders what's been in Barry's closet a little too long. <laughs> what are you talking about? Hmm? Oh, come on, he didn't seem gay to you? This level of suspicion is a bit rich, coming less than a minute after Frasier and Niles both fell all over each other to worship an opera director. In fairness, working in fashion had been a gay cliché on TV for decades, like on this 1965 episode of The Dick Van Dyke Show. Although openly queer characters did pop up on TV from time to time in decades past, a lot of media was squeamish about openly acknowledging the existence of gays. So on those occasions when shows or movies wanted queer characters to exist, but didn't want to actually say that they were queer, they were often coded, and working in fashion was one of the most frequent ways to do it. But by 2003, openly queer characters had become far more common on TV. There was no more need for code. Those old stereotypes were starting to come off as ridiculously old-fashioned, as Niles points out. The guy's not gay. <laughs> you know how you can tell? The muscles. Good point, Dad. Second tip off, no poodle. Yeah. But Fraser remains suspicious about Roz's boyfriend, Barry. And Fraser gets an opportunity to investigate him later that night. Fraser and Niles are walking home from a game of squash. And side note, Fraser had to borrow Niles' shorts because his ripped. And they see what they think is Barry entering a suspicious establishment. Bad Billy. What sort of place do you think that is? Well, let's see. Tuesday is leather night, so it's probably some sort of shoe outlet. <laughs> Fraser wants to prove that Roz's boyfriend is gay, so he heads in to catch him while Niles stands guard outside. And once again, we just have to talk for a minute about what mainstream television thinks gay bars are. On one hand, this place doesn't look all that different from my own local Seattle gay bar, but it's also called Bad Billy's and advertises a leather night on a Tuesday. Who has time after work? And I think it's a bit of a mismatch that it looks so much like the tasteful waiting room of a dentist's office. To be fair, this show isn't the first with a curious interpretation of a gay bar. 
Back in the 70s, Maude showed one that looked like somebody's living room. Murphy Brown's gay bar looks more like a men's warehouse. And Lauren Bacall discovered the world's most cavernous gay bar in the TV special Applause. I bring all this up because there's something crucial that all these weird TV gay bars seem to miss, which is that queer bars are primarily for queer people. So often when these bars appear on TV, it's because straight characters have gone to infiltrate them, rather than queer characters just going to relax and unwind. Gay bars are safe havens, and the fact that Frasier is going into a gay bar to out somebody is… not great. Anyway, as he arrives for his manhunt, Frasier finds the place to be quite welcoming. Hey, excuse me, uh, I'm looking for a guy. Yeah, I kinda got that from the shorts. <laughs> he spots a familiar face behind the bar. It's his furniture polisher, which is definitely not a naughty entendre inserted by the writers. But you're surprised to see me in here. <laughs> okay. The show has a fine line to walk here. They've got to acknowledge that Frasier fits a lot of gay stereotypes himself, even when he's not wearing those shorts. But the joke is that he's a bit of a hypocrite, suspecting Barry of being gay due to stereotypes, while he himself fits so many. Frasier's the butt of the joke not for conforming to gay cliches, but because he's relying so heavily on gay cliches, while also being obtuse about his own. Meanwhile, outside, Niles discovers that Barry never actually went into the bar. He just lives nearby. Niles tries to hide behind a magazine called Naked Guys Review. Boy, do I wish that was real. And then he rushes downstairs to grab Frasier. He has some difficulty shouting over the music. Well, that's pretty direct as pickup lines go. Do you think anyone noticed? Well, yes, as it turns out, the next day on his call-in show... I saw you in a gay bar last night. Frazier tries to explain the circumstances. I popped into Bad Billy's, looking for a man I was hoping was in the bathroom. <laughs> as for how I got into another man's shorts, that is no one's business. Good job, Frazier. Now, everyone in Seattle believes that he's gay, and they're honestly kind of nice about it. Nicer than I think he deserves, considering his intent when he went in there. I just want to say that your KACL family will be here for you as you take your first brave steps on that yellow brick road to pride and self-acceptance. Oh, shut up, you big queen! <laughs> but it turns out that there may be some unexpected consequences, or benefits, to the misunderstanding. Later, at the cafe, he runs into Alistair again, Make a closer connection. If it's any comfort, I went through the same thing myself once. Really? Yes, I was a guest on a call-in mm -hmm. show, and an angry ex-boyfriend phoned in. Everything came out. <laughs> I had quite a chat with the wife that night. Very frank. Oh. Very expensive. Oh. In sympathy, Alistair invites Fraser to a party with all his fancy opera friends, leaving Niles behind. I would kill to go to that party. I was at that gay bar too, you know. <laughs> From there, things escalate quickly between Frasier and Alistair. You'll turn my head, sir. Oh, well. <laughs> Alistair buys Frasier a fancy watch. He invites him to go to Madrid. He tells his famous friends about him. They flirt shamelessly with each other. In a way, they make a great couple, perfectly matched for each other. Frasier enjoys the attention and insists there's nothing going on between them. Well, it's not like it's the first gay friend I've ever had. It's the first one who thinks you're gay, too. <laughs> he does not think I'm gay. He thinks I'm gay and I'm standing next to my pregnant wife. <laughs> But Frasier simply won't hear of it. My friendship with Alistair is the best thing that's happened to me in months. I will not have you sully it by making it out to be something it's not. Sorry, my angel. <laughs> what we're seeing here is a phenomenon I talked about in the last video. The rapid shift in the 90s from gays as a source of trouble, like when he thought Barry was a deceiver, to gays as a fact of life, with Alistair openly discussing his sexuality, to gays as something aspirational, with Frasier pursuing a gay man with high social standing. Aspirational gay characters were a particularly pleasant development in the 90s. For decades, LGBTQ characters were only depicted as serial killers, or mentally ill, or tragic, or just a punchline. How dare you judge me? But in the late 90s, TV suddenly discovered that queer people can actually be really talented and really funny. So we started to see open depictions of queer people who could fix all the messes straight people got themselves into. In fact, the same year this episode of Frasier aired, Bravo launched a brand new show called Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, which was the most overt depiction to date of straight people who wanted to have LGBTQ folks in their lives. Suddenly, straight TV characters wanted our help. They wanted what we had. And few wanted it more than Frasier. Is there anything this man can't do? <laughs> Time will tell. <laughs> it's also pretty significant that the show cast Patrick Stewart in this role. He was, and of course still is, a huge star, much bigger than your typical sitcom guest. He'd appeared in the X-Men films, he was literally a magazine cover model alongside Cindy Crawford. Patrick Stewart was quite the sex symbol. Sorry, did I say he was? He is. 
Casting him not only as a gay man, but as an enormously powerful and popular gay man was quite meaningful, especially to a young gay nerd like me who was delighted to see that someone I looked up to wasn't afraid to play gay. Multiple times, in fact, Patrick Stewart was also queer in the movie Jeffrey. Can I do this? Or do I look like some sort of gay superhero? Things come to a head, as it were, at a party after the premiere of Alistair's new opera. This scene is, I have to say, one of my favorites in the show's entire run, and not just because of this incredibly charming painting of a dog in a dress uniform. Computer, zoom and enhance. Ah, a masterpiece. The sexual tension between Fraser and Alistair is reaching new heights. The production was a triumph. Wasn't it? <laughs> Smile. They're congratulated on their adorable relationship. So I hear that you and Alistair are quite an item. Oh, no, we're just very good friends. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. And Fraser finds that his flirtation with Alistair is yielding even more benefits. Nigel Fry is retiring and giving up his seat on the opera board. Oh. But I am thrilled to name as his successor, Frasier Crane. Oh. This is a crowning moment for Fraser, and even when Niles points out that everyone thinks he and Alistair are dating, he doesn't even seem to care. All my life, I have dreamed of being half of a power couple, and now I finally am. Is it perfect? No! <laughs> but it's fun, and I don't want it to end. He's completely bought into this relationship at this point, happy to go along with it if it means he gets a little taste of Alistair's power and prestige. But then he realizes there's something else he may soon be expected to taste. In fact, when I'm in rehearsals, I devote every ounce of strength to it. I even abstain from sex. Well, you can ask Frasier here. My poor, dear, patient Frasier. Well, looks like Nigel won't be the only one giving up his seat tonight. And that's when Frasier realizes there's more to being gay than fashion, fitness, and very small dogs. His only reason for thinking that Barry was gay was how he seemed. And yes, a TV character who worked in fashion could be reasonably assumed to be gay a decade or two earlier. Now that would be perfect if I was making dresses for your mother. But by the early 2000s, those old stereotypes are just laughably outdated. By the time this episode aired, there were more openly queer characters on television than ever, and they weren't all defined by collections of cliches like working in fashion. And yes, it might be a bit cliche that Alistair is devoted to opera, but so is Frasier, and he's definitely straight. The intensity, the heat, the desire. Can you feel it? Oh yes, there it is. Frasier realizes that as much as he wants the benefits of this relationship, there's one in particular that he really doesn't want. So he comes clean. I'm afraid I can never really be more than friends. Would three weeks on Capri in Bertolucci's villa change your mind? It's worth a try. But... <laughs> no. Alistair's disappointed, but he takes it in stride and asks if Frasier would at least stay a bit longer so it won't look like he's been dumped. And no sooner does Frasier agree to stick around for a few hours than someone mentions it's time to fire up the hot tub. I'm afraid I don't have a bathing suit. Then you'll fit right in. <laughs> and in a way, Frasier really will fit right in. Not just in the hot tub, but in the new TV landscape that would emerge over the next few years. Though Frasier was in its final season when this episode aired, we're seeing hints here of what's to come over the next decade. Shows featuring queer characters whose depictions are far more rich and complex than the simple cliches of decades past, like The L Word, Torchwood, The Office, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. This episode of Frasier came just at the start of TV offering those much more nuanced depictions. In that way, The Doctor Is Out serves as a sort of goodbye to the old cliches that TV once clung to. Cliches so old-fashioned, it could only be a joke. Land Ho, thanks for cruising along with us, and thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible with the pledge of support on Patreon. If you're enjoying Culture Cruise, head over to patreon.com slash mattbaum to support the show and get some backer rewards. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm late for the job fair. There are gay truck drivers and gay cops and gay lumberjacks, and I just thought, ooh, get her. <laughs> <laughs>